So I think one of the most uh, impactful ways is like, you know, cloud warehousing, the, you know, because of that additional complexity and that additional amount of load and, and that ease of use that cloud data warehousing is provided, we're seeing that cloud spend is really getting out of hand. Like, you know, you don't need to be a massive company to have a massive footprint on, on your Snowflake, for example, right? So this is exactly where we've seen uh, companies have been able to really leverage uh, automated warehouse optimization to significantly uh, reduce their, their bill, at the same time boost performance, but also reduce the amount of load that the data teams have to sort of, um, the amount of workload the data teams are are, are tasked with. But how, how is that different than, I mean, people have been trying to manage costs in a warehouse for a long time. How is it different so, with AI? So I think what's what's different here, like, you know, if you think about like the database industry over the past 35, 40 years, there's been numerous tools that basically give you visualizations. Oh, like here's, here's basically your performance. Here's what your cost is, right? Or even like some recommendation tools, right? But those things kind of fall on their face. Like if you go to a CFO and say, hey, how are you going to cut your you know, uh, Snowflake bill? They go to the data team and the data team says, well, you used my, this warehouse, you ran 10 million queries last week. This is what the cost of this is, right? So like to even to show people a visualization or to even go to them and say, hey, here's a bunch of recommendation. Feel free to apply it if you like. It's not very effective anymore in the modern scale of like cloud data warehousing because, hey, if the engineer could actually stare at like 1 million SQL queries and say how to, you know, this, these are the ones that you need to optimize or here's how you optimize it, you wouldn't need a tool in the first place, right? Let's face it, right? But also now you have users around the, around the world. I right? like you have people around the clock like hitting these data warehouses, right? So it's not, even if you basically had what I call an infinitely patient, infinitely competent uh, data engineer, they would come up with the optimal setting for today, for this hour, there's no guarantee that an hour from now, that's the optimal setting or 24 hours from now, that's still optimal or a week from now it's optimal. But you know, when you're relying on machine learning, you can analyze all of this stuff. Machine learning algorithms do the entirety of crunching data, but they can also do this continuously in real time, 24 seven. I think that's the paradigm shift that we've seen a lot of companies uh, have started leveraging. So if the workload's going down, you size to a smaller warehouse and yeah. save some credits, and then exactly. the workload goes up. Or, for example, exactly. You know, instead of say sending an alert to an, you know, text message to an a data engineer, like you know, two AM, and say, "Hey, now your workload went back up. Please go back to your default size." Now you can sort of have these automated warehouse optimization solutions track the load, track performance, and do it on your behalf on your behalf, according to your own uh, cost and performance goals. So that's where we've seen companies have, you know, uh, been very successful leveraging uh, AI for sure. Prashant, I'm seeing a lot of head nodding on on this. Uh, and you and oh, Arnab, we'll do you next because I see a head nodding there too. So maybe start with you, Prashant, go to Arnab, maybe. Yeah, we'll sure. yeah. You know what? I love um, well, the way the discussion is going, especially Clinton uh, laid out the three-year dimensions. Um, but one thing I feel that with all this, we have a huge problem to solve, which is reducing the cost and the effort associated with data engineering. But at the same time, one of the tools which we have to solve this problem is AI. So AI, all said and done, is great, but it's not cheap. It is terribly expensive. So people have to understand that when we talk about AI, it's not something that is going to check and be just a query. It's going to take a lot of uh, money. And it's going to take a huge amount of carbon footprint as well as we are living in the ESG days these days. So if you, but well, I was just reading a research from University of Massachusetts at Amherst, which says that a single model, which uh, Sue was talking about training, just training a simple AI model takes about almost like 600 pounds of carbon that's emitted. There's almost like five cards of uh, carbon emitted in their entire lifetime. So one thing is it's all great about AI and everything, but we also have to factor in about what Clinton was talking about, cost versus performance. Do we have a real solid use case so that we get the benefits out of this? So, you know, sometimes it could be very, very simple, like uh, the, not all problems need to be solved with, yeah, I think Bazan was talking initially, what can be automated and what needs to be automated? That's one of the fundamental questions which we need to ask before we start Probably, I might be wrong here. I hope I'm wrong here. Sh uh, chasing this shiny object called AI. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Arnab, um, how are how, how do you see organizations actually using AI in this case, and <clears throat> and hopefully in an intelligent way to keep Prashant happy? 
I think I can comment on 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 what uh, Barzan was saying, right? You know, elastic uh, workloads, right? Elast automated elastic workloads management, right? Uh, with the high or low watermark, you you change your workload automatically. You don't have to, you know, rely on people or you don't have to go to production diffusing bombs, right? Uh, so so that's that's what I've seen, and 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 I've actually uh, what for me what's what's important is, and what people forget is you have to look at cost and performance at, at the same time you cannot optimize for one forgetting the other right and with with ai there right it will you can you can look at at look at it from both the lenses and ensure that if, if you deploy the right model do the right amount of data profiling you're able to actually get to a, a elastic workload management system so Barzan, thank you for that and, and that's i i would conquer there and i've seen a lot of my clients uh, who are working with uh, things like uh, you know, new age technologies like Databricks or Snowflake, etc., where you've got cluster sizing or you've got warehouse, uh, warehouse elast warehouses to manage. Uh, moving that route, uh, Clinton. What would you say in this, this area? I uh, really appreciate all the thoughts already uh, shared here. So, as we talk with data engineers, um, how they're solving some of these challenges. So, first around uh, workloads and budget. One of the things they're able to do is run more workloads for their same budget. And uh, that's using cloud class management and data FinOps. So they're doing things like chargeback and showback. And just by simply doing those things, uh, some of the research is showing that companies are able to apply twice as many new approaches to improving cost management. Uh, there's also automated budget tracking and spend guardrails being put in place and alerts so that teams find out about their spending before the bill arrives, as opposed to retrospectively. In terms of uh, SLAs and operations and troubleshooting, a lot of organizations that we speak with now are starting to use automated performance optimization, proactively alerting before something goes off the rails in terms of delivery timeframe, and then data pipeline optimization to make sure things are as fast and performant as they can be. Um, and then finally, in terms of performance, uh, organizations are able to launch applications much faster with uh, speed, cost, and reliability optimization, but also automated pipeline bottleneck analysis and code level insights. So I remember as a software engineer at Microsoft, the most frustrating thing is when a bug that you think you fixed comes back to you is still not resolved. So we want to help engineers, you know, get through those and then put these issues behind them. So a lot of using the ability of AI and machine learning, the intelligence capability, the ability to monitor and evaluate, you know, myriad, in fact, millions of things, um, and, and then come up with some better recommendations for what to do. Um, and, 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 and just beyond, you know, uh, human's capability for in terms of just the complexity of the problem, but also as Barzan was talking about the 724 nature, I mean, you solved it. And then three seconds later, you know, that's no longer the answer. So it seems, Sue, would you add anything to this area? I would, because here, you asked about practical use cases in the real world, right? Yeah. So going back to the fundamentals of what Prashant and others here have talked about, but specifically what Prashant talked about, you don't need AI for everything, right? You know, so you first have to figure out where do you want to apply because it is that cost performance balance, right? So that's the first, that's the business case that you're going to build. The second thing is around the data set. The assumption is that uh, data is simple. Data is not simple. There are various types of data and data could be simple and it could range all the way to being very, very complex. You take healthcare, you take uh, industries that are very heavily regulated. I'll talk about healthcare, life sciences, then say banking, right? Uh, because that's also my wheelhouse, but I work in different sectors. You can also look at manufacturing and supply chain. Um, but but anyway, so let's just stick to that. So the second thing is, why should I be applying AI or why should I be applying Gen AI? This goes back to what are you, are you trying to augment, right? So one is the cost, the workload balance that we're talking about, the cost performance, the quality. The second is, actually redu uh, uh, being able to reproduce and also stabilize, right? So I'm talking about large complex data sets, right? Now then comes the issue around data quality. So what can we easily say across every industry? I've worked in 19 industries, I've worked globally. 
where you can easily say, yeah, you know what, this is worth it because it it can be scaled. I can rely on it being stable, quote unquote. I understand that there's going to be an iterative process, but the uh, uh, 24-7 that Barzan and others here have talked about, it's going to be reduced over time. So very um, a good example is anything related to, um, you know, actually Clinton mentioned it, SLAs, contracts, right? Federal government contracts, state government contracts, contracts that are out there. So part of it is I can easily discern, you know, I mean, things don't really change that much, especially when you're talking about government, right? If you talk about healthcare, there are some new programs that could be coming in. But regulatory things are more or less, you know, quote unquote, there over a period of time. This is where you can start applying AI. This is where you can start applying Gen AI. This is where you can get input from different stakeholders. Remember that the end users are not just, you know, economists or uh, employees of a government, but they are all the way from the sea level all the way to, to the analysts. So when a data engineering uh, group is actually thinking about the use cases, that's why I always say, think about the context, where you want to apply, why you want to apply, what is it that you're trying to augment or supplement, and then is it really, just does it justify that cost performance and quality uh, balance? 